welcome to the 2020 State of Public Education, um, the, the largest uh, virtual gathering we've hosted at the Dallas Regional Chamber um, this year. Um, the last time I heard, we have over 900 um, folks signed up today, and that makes a lot of sense. I couldn't imagine a more important um, um, topic at a time like this. My name is John Olajide, and I'm the founder and CEO of Access and the 2020 DRC board chair. Today, we're going to hear from our friend and native son of Dallas, Texas Commissioner of Education, Mac Morath, followed by a panel of regional educational leaders. I wanna thank you all for being here today. Our event this afternoon is presented by Toyota Motor North America and Wells Fargo with, with support from our gold sponsor, Thompson Reuters, and our silver sponsors, um, Encore and Iconic IT. Before I became the DRC chair in January, I spent a lot of time last year thinking about what I wanted to help the DRC focus on this year. And I settled on four areas, business as a force for good, supporting small business, promoting and ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion, and education. I believe it's essential that everyone in every neighborhood in our community has the opportunity to participate and benefit from our continued prosperity. And that is only possible with a quality education. And I'm sure we all agree that the earlier we start investing in our students, the better our outcomes will be. At the DRC, education is woven into the fabric of everything we do for two reasons. We want every young star to have an opportunity, to have every opportunity, really, for a good education, a good job, and a good life. And just as importantly, our businesses need well-educated employees to help us all succeed. So I am looking forward to hearing what our leaders in education have to say about where things currently stand. It's my pleasure now to introduce Chris Nielsen, the Executive Vice President um, for Product Support and the Chief Quality Officer at Toyota Motor North America to share a few remarks on behalf of uh, one of our presenting sponsors and also to introduce the commissioner and our moderator for today. Chris is a fellow board member of the Dallas Regional um, Chamber and my immediate predecessor. And I, I embarrass Chris all the time when I say he's my boss. Chris and Toyota are tireless advocates for education in the Dallas region. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Chris today. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, John, thanks very much for your introduction. Uh, if you're gonna refer to me as, as your boss, I'm only gonna refer to you as Mr. Chairman from, from now on. <laughs> So Toyota Motor North America, along with our co-presenting sponsors, Wells Fargo, are excited to bring this very critical conversation about public education to all of our attendees in conjunction with the DRC. At Toyota, we look forward to this event each year, given our long-term commitment to supporting education and workforce initiatives. And we understand the pressing need to link education to the careers of the future. There are millions of unfilled STEM careers in this country, including many in North Texas. And we are proud of the work we're doing here in our own backyard to help to solve this, uh, this problem. Our partnership with DISD and SMU to create a STEM K through eight school in West Dallas is top of mind. It'll provide much needed STEM education in a very diverse yet economically challenged neighborhood. The $2 million partnership is not just about the financial commitment, but it's the time, the energy, and the expertise used to develop a curriculum, to train teachers, and to ensure that other socioeconomic needs of the community are met in partnership with nonprofits. Now, this is an example of a strong public-private partnership for the betterment of our community. With the school opening next fall, I'd like to invite the commissioner <laughs> out for a tour this time next year, hopefully by then without, uh, without the need for masks. Uh, now let me talk about the format for today's conversation. Commissioner Morath will update us 
on pressing statewide edu education issues and the challenges of reopening Texas public schools during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this will be in a fireside chat format with our moderator today, Leona Allen Ford, the deputy publisher at the Dallas Morning News. Then Cindy Giles, the division executive for North Texas and Oklahoma with Wells Fargo Commercial Banking, will share a few remarks. And then we'll transition to the conversation with our regional education leaders. And we have a number of local, regional, and state elected officials joining us today for this event. Thank you to all for being with us today and all you do on, on behalf of our community. And throughout this conversation, um, I, I want to, uh, to note that you may use the chat function at the bottom of your screens to submit your questions for the commissioner. And I'll note that we will adjourn uh, promptly at 1.30. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest of honor, the Texas Commissioner of Education, Mike Morath. To us at the Dallas Regional Chamber, Commissioner Morath needs, of course, no introduction. He's a product of Garland ISD Public Schools and credits the DRC's Leadership Dallas program for kickstarting his public service. He previously served as an elected member of the Dallas ISD Board of Trustees and took over as Texas Commissioner of Education in January of 2016, following his appointment by Governor Abbott. We are so grateful to have you with us today, Commissioner. Now, moderating the discussion with Commissioner Morath is Leona Allen Ford, a longtime Dallas Morning News editor who was recently promoted to deputy publisher of the paper. And in that role, she's responsible for diversity and inclusion across the entire company. Congratulations to you, Leona, on the new position. Commissioner Morath and Leona, I'll now turn over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Commissioner Morath, it's so good to see you again. Um, I think I can speak for um, parents, educators, uh, business leaders, anyone who cares about education, that um, there's no better topic, there's no more important topic um, than public education. We're facing unprecedented challenges, the likes of which few of us have ever seen. So let's, uh, let's get to it. Commissioner, what are the significant actions the TEA has taken to support Texas school districts as they return to school this fall? Um, thank you. That, um, it's, a, it's a great question and it's been a lot uh, that we, you know, we're, I'm joined today by uh, three of our local superintendents as well as uh, board chair, Justin Henry. And, um, uh, Dallas in particular is in very good, um, very good hands with uh, Justin. Known him for years. He's uh, such a thoughtful servant leader. But um, uh, these folks have been um, working pretty tirelessly uh, throughout the crisis, as have uh, we at TEA, um, um, my team uh, broadly. Um, we uh, starting really on day one. I think on March 12th I was on the phone with 100 superintendents. On March 13th I was on the phone with 900 superintendents. We went to daily uh, briefings. Um, uh, we're now down to once weekly briefings um, on all things coronavirus related. I, I think we've received uh, north of 5,000 emails, you know, questions, comments, this, this sort of thing um, uh, from uh, school system leaders around the state. Uh, one of the, the key things that we uh, knew we needed to, to do uh, really uh, right as this uh, crisis began uh, for our schools was just be an information conduit. Uh, uh, as, as districts were wrestling with different issues, um, some of those, uh, some districts were experiencing them earlier than others, and we try to share the knowledge as, as effectively as possible. Um, as the uh, as the crisis has unfolded into, you know, and from an initial crisis response to just a new normal, um, we have uh, uh, focused on a, a, a set of twin um, uh, initiatives. The first is what, what set of actions do we do to improve safety, to make sure that school can happen, can happen so that staff are kept safe, so that students are kept safe, and their families and our communities uh, remain safe. Um, and the second set of actions, though, is, is what do we do to re-engineer the school experience, knowing this new environment that we're in, so that our students grow academically, socially, 
um, uh, emotionally um, as as effectively as possible. So we 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 educate them um, to the you know highest levels of literacy and math and and character, even while we have to adapt to this new environment um, that we are faced in. So um, as part of that, we've done a lot. Um, we've uh, 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 collaborate very closely with uh, all of our public health partners. I feel like I've got at least like honorary credit for half a first year of med school in the last six months um, uh, with all of the uh, public health guidance um, uh, as we've talked to epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists from around the globe and, and tried to share both what are uh, required and what are effective practices in mitigating viral spread. We created an entire new framework for the school finance system so that um, uh, uh, school districts are funded for remote instruction uh, for the entirety of the year. Uh, and funded at the same level that they would be funded at if uh, kids were in person. Um, we have uh, tried to facilitate remote instruction more effectively. We, uh, the governor launched Operation Connectivity to bridge the digital divide so that folks who uh, need to stay home for health reasons can stay home but have access to internet and broadband. Um, we, uh, collectively, we spend almost a billion dollars uh, between now, uh, you know, March and, and today on bridging the uh, gap. And in fact, we wouldn't be here, uh, I, I would be remiss without mentioning Dr. Anna Hostess in particular for having the, the original uh, idea for the Operation Connectivity and helping us um, uh, uh, get it launched and, and um, advocate for it so effectively. The, um, uh, the, the, we've also facilitated a bunch of planning exercises between public health partners and uh, school districts around the state so that what do you do if there's a case on campus and how do you respond to it? How do you notify? How do you uh, clean a campus? How do you um, um, uh, minimize the amount of disruption educationally that happens while keeping folks safe? Um, we deployed $50 million worth of PPE, masks, uh, uh, face shields, uh, 500,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, which uh, it was always kind of interesting just seeing in one place. But the, the um, so a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of work related to keeping people safe uh, through the crisis. But also right. uh, we at TEA have been focused on a whole host of uh, academic initiatives, instructional initiatives. Um, we are providing to the state and have provided the state free online uh, learning systems um, for every single school district in Texas, uh, which is that it was a, a mild benefit, say, for Dallas, but a significant benefit for a lot of our rural schools, which did not have, say, Dallas's infrastructure. Um, we have uh, been providing digitally native uh, curricular tools uh, because you can imagine the instructional experience really needs to shift if, if you're in a, a traditional classroom environment and you, you're now, say, all or partially remote. The, the kind of lessons that you engage in need to be different. So. Um, we've we worked to build that out and deploy it as uh, effectively as possible. We've provided uh, training for principals, uh, free training for I think over eight, eight or nine thousand principals around the states to how to to operate a remote instructional school as effectively as possible. We've stood up an entire uh, training system for teachers focused on uh, mental health, both themselves and their students, and looking for signs of additive trauma uh, in the kids during this crisis. Um, and how they as teachers can be better equipped to respond to that and help the kids build their own uh, self-regulation skills and otherwise um, learn how to, to, to roll with the punches that life throws at us um, uh, and, um, and more. Uh, but that's a, to not answer your question with like a 30 minute speech, I figured <laughs> I'd stop there. So but, yeah, but we, yeah, we've been we, working we'll uh, pretty nonstop and, and um, <laughs> trying to provide support to our school leaders around the state. We'll, we'll get into some more of those details uh, as we go along, but we had a little breaking news yesterday. The TA released its first report of, uh, speaking of the, the information, the conduit on documented cases. It showed about 4,500 documented cases, which is about 2% of the students. It's about 0.2%. It's about 0.2%. It's about 0 .2%. Yeah. Point 2% of the students and staffers uh, since activities began. And as you know, many parents are craving this data, trying to make decisions on face-to-face -face and remote learning. Can you walk us through the state's reporting requirements and um, the decision to track cases and just tell folks where they can get that information that they're craving? Sure. So the uh, school systems around the state have a uh, have a requirement that anytime there is a confirmed case on campus, they have to notify the entire campus community. So all, all, all students, parents, uh, staff, teachers, 
uh, everybody deserves a right to know, even if they're not directly affected. There's other steps that uh, school districts and public health take with regard to folks that had direct contact. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a basic notice requirement. There's also a requirement to notify public health uh, about the individual cases so the public health can work and try to stem any uh, broader infection that might come from uh, the individual uh, person infected. Um, separate from that, though, we ask school systems to submit to our partners at the State uh, Department of S uh, State Health Services um, this same information what, uh, uh, so that we can, in the aggregate, keep an eye on that in real time and know what, what the virus is doing uh, on campuses. And so that information is available. You can go to TEA's website, tea.texas.gov slash coronavirus and find really every piece of information under the sun. But there's a, there's a, a link somewhere in there that's, um, that, uh, that's found. Uh, I know you can also buy a Dallas Morning News um, uh, and uh, in today's paper, you can see a find a link to that same online dashboard. Not that I'm, you know, shilling for our, uh, my hometown paper. Appreciate um, that. Appreciate absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. This product placement was brought to you by, um, so, um, no, so we, we try to make uh, information as available as transparently as possible, but there is a lot of information. So sometimes, sometimes hard to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, uh, but, uh, what the information that's available now is, uh, a, a caseload by, uh, either adults or students, um, and within a week, it'll all be broken out by district as well. And, and we update that, uh, I should say, our partners at DISHES, mm -hmm. uh, the Texas Department of State Health Services, it's a fun acronym I've learned, um, uh, is um, uh, they update that about once a week. Commissioner, do you have, uh, you know, some of the bigger school districts haven't started face-to-face -face yet. I'm just thinking, uh, you know, how are you feeling the big districts haven't done face-to-face? -face? So you have the... Uh, um, how are you approaching concerns about the bigger ones haven't gone back yet? And, um, you yep. know, that's a small percentage of the cases for sure. And, uh, but we know we have a bunch more kids coming. Yeah. As of, as of the first week of instruction, which is itself a complicated question, because believe it or not, there's some schools in Texas that start in July every year. It's not, uh, it's not well known, uh, but it is, it does happen. Um, so as of the first week of district's instruction, we have about 1.1 uh, million kids that are on campus experiencing instruction around the state. Um, uh, but we have created a, a rules framework that tries to provide a, a degree of flexibility for uh, local school systems to respond given different levels of community spread um, and, uh, and different impacts in the healthcare system. So um, uh, some school systems uh, in you know, our urban areas are experiencing on-campus enrollment in kind of a smaller scale. Some still aren't, aren't experiencing it very much at all. Others at a larger scale. Um, as, as they learn uh, from their operator, operational procedures, we try to pass that knowledge base along to uh, peers and colleagues around the state. Um, uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the virus is declining generally, uh, certainly from its highs um, around the 4th of July. Um, and so there's a lot more, even now, school districts that are starting, and we're well past the first week of instruction for a lot of districts. Um, uh, so we're, we're trying to keep an eye on that. We're also trying to keep an eye on enrollment trends because that has an impact on the school finance system mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, you know, adapt uh, uh, accordingly. Like one thing that is certainly true during this crisis is, um, you know, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy and the enemy is this little virus. And so every day we're, we're trying to be nimble and adjust. Got that. And, and I've seen that for sure in our school district. And school districts, as you mentioned before, uh, Commissioner, were thrown into a virtual learning, uh, just thrown into it this spring. It was rough, rough for some districts, but also a lot of innovations. Can you talk about what you're seeing around the state and in, 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 by the way of innovation and how educators are and kids are benefiting from that? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing both good and bad um, around the states, um, uh, but there is a lot of things that folks are learning that we as educators are learning during this crisis, just like uh, businesses around the, the country have learned about uh, how to adjust to teleworking and the tools environment. In some cases, the, um, uh, we will come out stronger um, in terms of our educational practices than, than we did initially. The, um, as districts are getting more comfort and more familiar with a lot of the, uh, these digital learning tools, they're uh, figuring out when they can be used um, uh, to, to improve um, uh, education, um, uh, to, 
I think about the feedback um, and the ability to collaborate sort of at all hours um, uh, among students. Um, so these are, these are a lot of things that I think folks are learning. There's also different ways that um, school leaders are uh, realizing that they can support the equitable growth of their staff. Um, it's a lot easier for me to pop in and see instruction happening in a Zoom session um, very quickly than it is to you know, necessarily walk around. Uh, and I could also potentially record that and provide sort of John Madden style feedback to the teacher a little, maybe, um, you know, if we adjust to where our X's and O's were, um, a little Johnny, um, you know, masters the lesson more effectively. So I think there's a, a lot of that that folks are learning. There, there really are some interesting bright spots that we're seeing um, in districts all over the state, but it's, um, it is still, we are, um, we are but babes in the woods um, in this journey uh, yet. And, and the, the learning is happening very, very rapidly among our, our school system leaders. I know, uh, for example, in Garland, we'll have an intersessional session for the fir very first time, start of October. Interested in how you think, you know, signals you're getting on how those might go. It's a new concept for folks, but um, I'm hearing good things from parents about it. Yeah, it's, um, and they're doing a bunch of interesting things, I think, with their calendar in Garland, both educationally and um, even from a viral perspective, because they've they kind of set it up so that they, if they need to, they can go um, at a hybrid schedule two weeks at a stretch, which you think about the sort of 14-day viral incubation um, um, a timeline for the, uh, for, for the way COVID-19 works. Mm -hmm. So, but um, no, I mean, one of the things that, that Garland is, is doing is, is not, not just sort of changing their calendar, but they're creating more time. Um, you know, as a, as a software developer, uh, they, we had a, a saying in our industry, it's called the iron triangle, right? You, if you're thinking about a software project, there's, there's time, there's resources, and there's scope. And if you want one of those things to move, you got to think about one of the other two things. So if we want our kids to learn more, uh, we either need to think about resourcing or, or time. Um, and historically, we've operated schools only about 172 days in this country. Um, and uh, for most employees, uh, they're used to working more than 172 days. Um, and so the, the, the question is, can we use the, this uh, concept of time uh, that a lot of people are seeing coronavirus and its impact on school operations and they're, they're considering things that they didn't used to consider and, it, and if it's done thoughtfully, it can be a gift to educators and to children, because if I want, you know, every third grader to have memorized their times table by the end of the third year of school, um, if I have more time in order to go deep on these lessons to build that arithmetic knowledge, then I can get a lot more kids to mastery than I could have without the gift of time. And I could potentially slow down my own life as a teacher. So instead of working 60 hours a week, maybe I come down to a more manageable 45 to 50 hours a week um, in, the, in the workload. So, um, but it does involve significant changes in the way we sort of operate school. It also involves, um, you know, changes for parents uh, in, in adjusting to the sort of new schedule. But um, uh, the, the evidence uh, from this goes back to the 70s um, and is pretty strong. And for especially disadvantaged kids um, adding more to the instructional calendar, spacing it out more, um, it can be game-changingly positive. Mm -hmm. But um, you know that's a big change. It's fraught with organizational peril. Um, uh, but it's just exciting to see that there's some districts that you know, you know, now we've got to change everything no matter what. The yep. virus is requiring us to change. So mm -hmm. why not that too? Yeah. Um, so it's it's really I'm I'm excited to see how um, how that change works for Garland and the other districts that are moving in that direction. So um, talking about a little bit about the digital divide that we've discovered, um, students and families across the state, um, you know, it's shown that some people have really good access, some people don't have much at all, and school districts have had to um, really jump through some hoops to meet the technology needs, you know, trying to come up with hot spots to help kids who, who, who don't have access in their homes. You, you mentioned Operation Connectivity. Can you talk a little bit about how you feel it's going, what, where that is in the process, and um, how the business community and, and the rest of us can help with that? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, uh, this sort of started a phone call from Dr. Hannah Hosa to me um, surfacing, hey, like how 
are you seeing this problem around the state and what are we doing about it? And so uh, one thing leads to another, the governor launches Operation Connectivity and um, uh, Dr. Hannah Hosa and I co-chair the task force um, uh, for it. Um, we have, um, uh, we've, we've learned a lot about the digital divide. We, you know, as a country, we've kind of been talking about the digital divide for the better part of 20 years, but we've done more in the last six months in Texas to narrow this gap than we have in the last 20 years as a country. Um, the, uh, a part of it is knowing where the divide is. And mm -hmm. what I will say is that our insight into the divide was very fuzzy. Um, there's census data and there's some sort of anecdotal data, but it's not, uh, it wasn't with precision that every school system in Texas knew which kids when they went home had access to internet and devices. So we're looking at that as part of kind of an, the enrollment system um, and districts have been actively asking these questions, but we still don't have real precision on that um, statewide. But what we, what we saw generally is we thought about, um, if I remember correctly, it was about 1.6 million kids in Texas did not have appropriate learning devices at home. So think laptops, iPads, Chromebooks, something like that. Um, and 1.9 million kids at home didn't have internet. Um, we have uh, effectively closed the device guide, uh, gap as a state. Um, we have uh, acquired, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I forget the exact number, but it's like two and a half million to three million devices in the last uh, several months. Um, and those are almost 100% deployed. They're, um, there's still some supply chain issues, but they'll, they'll be basically all deployed by uh, October, um, uh, which is pretty incredible uh, historically. We made a big dent in the internet access gap, but not, um, not uh, we didn't close it. Um, and uh, part of our operation connectivity was um, thinking about this in phases where we do a, a, a triage response, which is by hotspots, because that's the quickest way between no internet and internet. But of course, hotspots don't work in every location. Right. Um, so that's the reason why we haven't been able to, to solve it for everybody. So the, uh, 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 so the triage project is basically done. Um, our medium term phase, which is what we're in the midst of now, is where can we find commercially viable um, internet access? Where can we negotiate with vendors so that we get the best deal possible for our kids and our taxpayers? Um, uh, so that those kids have, uh, you know, broadband access. Um, and, and so we're going to be executing that phase basically during this school year is um, think of, um, you know, cable internet access getting turned up in an apartment that it didn't, it didn't have it before. Um, uh, and so we're actively involved in phase two. Um, phase three is more longer term where you still need fiber and towers, you need construction, and it's going to take longer for that to happen. That's uh, predominantly a problem in rural Texas, but not exclusively a problem in rural Texas. And so we're, we're working all, all phases sort of simultaneously, but we're hot and heavy now in, in the medium term phase. Well, you've got a captive audience of business folks here. How, how can they help you? What, what can they do? Well, for the, yeah, uh, for the business leaders on the call that are in the uh, internet service provider space, you are likely to receive a loving phone call from somebody representing the agency here in the next few months. Uh, we are going to try to arm wrestle you to the cheapest price possible, and we will be great, grateful for whatever uh, deals you are able to, uh, to provide us uh, during that time period. Um, uh, so our folks in business that are in actual telecom have, have already stepped up to the plate AT&T, Verizon, yep. um, and then, of course, the major hardware manufacturers, Dell and um, uh, Google and, and uh, which was for Chromebooks and the like. So huge thank you to these, these companies. I'm, I'm not mentioning everybody now. Sorry, I'm, I'm definitely going to leave some people off. I, my media people should have given me a list. I would have I've done better. But, but we've, got a, we've got a lot of, of uh, very strong um, uh, partnership support from folks in the telecom and, and IT hardware space. We will need more, um, especially for internet service uh, provider, um, you know, longer term internet service, service access deals. Um, um, for folks outside of that uh, industry, one is just remember your employees are probably parents and they're going to need continued support and grace during this time period. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and two, whatever you can do um, financially um, to support your local school system in uh, acquiring that, that internet service for their families um, uh, is going to be beneficial. Awesome. Awesome. And, and um, talking through um, some of the things that changed last year, star testing and assessments were waived and already there's been some calls to suspend them for this year. Um, 
what are we doing or what things are you guys talking about to understand the depth of learning from this COVID period? And what could this mean for the state's accountability system? Um, you know, how are we going to access where students are academically and make sure they're on the right track? Yeah, well, I mean, the one of the key uh, aspects of education as a discipline is uh, discerning student mastery. If uh, you think about this, uh, if this were analogous to a classroom, you would you would then accuse me of terrible instructional practice because I have no idea whether anybody listening to what I'm saying actually <laughs> understands what I'm saying. So, you know, teaching without some form of testing is just talking. Um, uh, so our, our, our classroom teachers are regularly engaged in constantly diagnosing students for um, how well did you understand today's lesson? How well um, uh, have you mastered the material? The, the, the statewide uh, uh, pr program of assessment um, is highly beneficial because it actually um, uh, can diagnose, um, or I should say sort of summatively discern how well that was remembered long-term because it's different than a kind of test in the moment versus you remember it four months later. Yeah. Um, and the state test is designed really to sort of gauge how well all the curriculum at, at, across, across the state did, did the third grader not just master, you know, memorize their times tables, but did they learn all these things about fractions and arithmetic and all the mathematical concepts that needed to be learned. That's what those state tests are designed to do. So the fact that we don't have them from last year means we don't know how well our kids um, mastered summatively the, the Texas student expectations uh, by grade level, which is a huge weakness uh, that uh, deprives education leaders from discerning what kind of curricular adjustments they make, what kind of supports the teachers need to be adjusted. So it's, it is a major loss um, that we are blinded to that academic information. I mean, it was, it's, um, you think about the COVID crisis, like we're better off if we have more people um, that have access to COVID tests because then we can see what's going on with the virus in our community. We're similarly better off understanding where our students are in terms of mastery of their, of their content knowledge. Um, so it's definitely a, a, um, a mistake not to have access to assessment information. Um, so we have stood up um, uh, optional assessments aligned to the Texas standards for school districts to use around the state, the state for a beginning of year kind of benchmark, uh, as it were, just to, to see where the kids are coming back um, and, and whether or not um, gaps have exacerbated and, and if so, for whom, uh, so that school systems can use that to uh, intervene appropriately. Some school systems pay uh, you know, a decent amount of money out of their own pocket for their own kind of um, assessment systems. Uh, MAP is a, a pretty common assessment used um, that I know uh, several, uh, several of the leaders on this call invest heavily in. Um, but our, our beginning of year assessment that the state offers is, is free for, for districts. Um, and, uh, and then we'll want to continue to, to uh, discern how well students have mastered their, um, their content um, uh, uh, for the purpose of making educational adjustments. The, the other question you ask is really accountability. So um, accountability is a question about of how well are we managing performance? What's, what are our goals for our students? What are our goals for us as adults in supporting our students? To, to have them reach certain levels um, of proficiency writ large and have we met those goals or not? Um, and if we haven't met their, those goals, do we have the ability to reflect on that and adjust? So yeah, we do uh, intend to publish that information so that folks can engage in those performance management conversations um, at the end of the year because um, you know we, we spend a lot of money on public education. So mm -hmm. it's almost $70 billion a year now in the state of Texas, we need to find out um, how well that money is working for our kids and how well we as adults are meeting, um, meeting their needs. Commissioner, do you see, when will a decision be made on, are, are we gonna take the star or not? Um, and if we're not gonna take the star, what, um, you know, what, what form at, what, what testing system we'll be using? Uh, I mean, uh, I think that decision essentially has already been uh, made. We've, we've been pretty consistently announcing that um, like the reason we didn't have a star test last year is because we didn't have kids in school. So the whole system was shut down. So the, um, the expectation is certainly by April, we're gonna have you know, several million children in school buildings and should be able to uh, assess them. Um, right. And as a result, should be able to, to discern how we as a system are working to support them. Got it, got it. Um, speaking, going from one difficult thing to another, uh, the upcoming legislative session is, 
<laughs> going to be upon us soon. Um, you know, last session we we touted uh, certainly our newspaper did the six point five billion dollar investment, additional dollars um, on significant reforms and innovations. How do we protect these gains and how can school public school supporters focus their advocacy to, to not, not go backwards and, and also grow that number? What's in your view are some things we can- Yeah, I, uh, I'm always somewhat cautious in answering these questions because uh, I am, you know, I'm a state employee. I, I'm staff, the legislature runs a joint. Um, so, um, you know, what, what they pass, we implement. Um, uh, and um, it, it generally, I, uh, I'm not in, the, in a position where I, I, I don't lobby um, uh, the legislature. I, I answer questions that they ask me. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that the, the work that citizens do in Texas to support wise public policy is always necessary. Um, uh, you know, we, we, I think are, are really blessed in Texas to have a, uh, have, you know, a state leadership that is really focused on creating student focused, um, education policy and, um, making investments that are based on outcomes, not uh, based on inputs, um, uh, to drive, uh, meaningful improvements in, in, uh, in the lives of our kids. Um, you know, and I, I, Think that that we're more you know blessed in Texas to have that kind of um, policy framework and that kind of uh, state leadership. That um, I mean that that being said, I mean I'm I live in this democracy like anybody else. We're only one election away from chaos, uh, so you know the uh, I, people need to you know pay attention to the political process uh, as they normally as they normally would. Got it. Got it. Um, well, one thing that has been clear is I think we all have a better appreciation for what teachers do day in and day out. <laughs> I can speak personally that I really am praising my teachers now. Um, we were thrust into that work and I'm not, I, I wasn't very good at it. We're, we're, um, we know that this is supposed to be the year of the teacher and the World Teacher Day is approaching on October 5th. Um, these teachers have become our heroes, and I think respect for them has grown among parents and communities uh, more so during this pan pandemic. What do we as a community need to do to support our Texas educators who are at the ground level of all, all of this work? Yeah, the, um, I think the insight that folks have uh, gained into the uh, uh, you know, daily work of the teacher has uh, grown by leaps and bounds. I think of my brother who lives in Arlington with his kids and he keeps sending me these text messages uh, that as he was experiencing uh, driving instructional leadership at home, he's like, yeah, if I'm the teacher, I definitely need to be fired. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think we've all developed a much higher appreciation for what our, our teachers are doing um, every day. Um, the, the, um, you know, the, I, I always uh, think about like this is how do we as individuals get involved in our public school system? You know, our schools are, our public schools are schools that the public owns. Um, so we as owners of those schools either take responsibility for what's happening um, or we abdicate that and, um, and see what happens. So there's a bunch of different ways that we as individuals can get involved in our schools. But I think it, it, it you know, it's, it starts at the level for individual kids, how we can volunteer as a mentor, as a big brother, big, you know, as I was a big brother for 10 years and wouldn't actually wouldn't be in this role had it not been for the experience I had as a big. Um, uh, but, you know, wrong, if volunteers a reading tutor, that that sort of thing. But it's also, you know, you know, bringing love offerings to our teachers, uh, uh, helping them uh, know that they're appreciated from simple things, you know, baking them cookies and stuff to uh, giving them their, uh, uh, you know, the Christmas, um, you know, uh, gift cards that, uh, that we all generally do and, and, um, uh, and also like doing the things they ask us to do for our children um, is, uh, is, you know, is part of the lift. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it, but you can get involved at, at, um, you know, more significantly join the local PTA, join your school, uh, your local school um, advisory board or site-based decision-making committee. Um, uh, and if, you know, you really want to get involved to support teachers, you can always, um, run for school board. Uh, it, uh, it's a decision as a, somebody who is an entrepreneur and lived a very pleasant and financially lucrative life. I 
don't ever regret having walked away from my company and run for public office in Dallas and where as a school board member, everyone always, you know, respects your opinions. No one ever questions your integrity or, you know, always ever, celebrates, ever, ever, everyone ever. always celebrates your, your public service. <laughs> Well, I'm getting the 10 minute warning here. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions from uh, the group. Um, uh, questions about the legislature. Um, what kind of questions are you getting from our state leaders? You know, are they to tr trying to get a, a sense of what areas they're, they're looking for guidance from you on? What, what questions are you being asked? So uh, part of the, um, the biennial legislative process in Texas is, uh, you know, the legislature meets for like 150 days every two years. In between then, there's something called interim charges, which is their sort of formal way of asking, um, uh, you know, probing questions on matters of state policy. So the, oh, there's a bunch of interim charges that have been published in, and uh, the committee chairs, uh, Chair Huberty and Chair Taylor, um, are the uh, public education chairs in both chambers that I work with uh, very closely. And of course, those we're, we're blessed to have uh, those kinds of servant leaders in Texas, but the, they've, they've begun asking questions about the school finance system. Um, as you can imagine, there's a, a large number of financial concerns that the state has as it tries to balance its budget every two years. Um, uh, questions about the impact of House Bill 3 policy changes, questions about how schools are responding um, uh, uh, during the COVID crisis, questions about distance learning, um, uh, questions about you know, discipline and uh, special education and everything uh, else uh, imaginable. Wow, wow. Um, another question from our group, uh, the business community, of course, cares about talent and workforce preparation. The pandemic has impacted many aspects of education. So can you please tell us how the state and districts are um, adapting to provide career and technical education? Um, this is a really a workforce force readiness question? Well, I mean, you're in an area where you're seeing maybe one of the better, uh, up, you know, perhaps even the best example in the United States with what Dallas uh, and, and Dr. Hinojosa have done with the P-TECH initiative. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't even know how many campuses he's got that he's kind of P-TECH converted, but it's, it's a lot. Um, and that's, a, that's an initiative that marries uh, K-12 education with higher education and workforce. So the kids graduate theoretically with an associate's degree, a trade-focused associate's degree, and meaningful industry credential and already work experience, job embedded work experience. We've tried to create resources based upon feedback that we've gotten from major employers in the state of Texas on the kinds of specific technical CTE focused career and technical skills that um, students need more, more at bats with, more practice with while they're in, the, mm -hmm. um, in, their, in their high school setting and cre had created a wealth of resources for school leaders and business leaders when they're coming together to help plan uh, curricular pathways um, uh, at the high school level, um, uh, and um, uh, but uh, for for employers in the room, you should talk to your your local um, you know, superintendent, your local uh, uh, school board, about how you can uh, uh, sign up for a formal PTEC partnership, whether it's in Plano or Richardson or Dallas or any of our other um, uh, districts in the region. Um, uh, because that's uh, uh, what's going to jumpstart um, the kids getting sort of far more technical experience than they otherwise would. I, I reflect on that, even my own experience in Garland. This was before, you know, P-TECH was a thing. Um, I got a uh, international baccalaure uh, baccalaureate diploma from Garland uh, High School, which um, is broadly known as a really well-rounded liberal arts education. But I had four years of, of, of very focused CTE um, in Garland as well. I had a year of typing and three years of computer science. Um, and that CTE experience base was literally worth millions of dollars to me personally. So um, helping districts um, make those uh, curricular opportunities available to kids is, is pretty critical. Awesome. One last question before we transition into the rest of the panel. Uh, just your assessment on how the education system will be permanently changed from what we've learned during this pandemic and the innovation school districts have made. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of um, innovation that districts have experienced during this time period that will uh, serve our kids well for years to come. There's obviously a lot of bad also that is um, associated with the virus, not to underplay that. But, the, um, you know, I think about the uh, sort of high school environment. And right now you've got districts that are experiencing um, by necessity a hybrid instructional setting where kids are some days they're remote and some days they're in person. Uh, and talking to uh, campus leaders and, and uh, 
uh, district leaders, education leaders around the state, that fixture of high school um, seems like it actually could be a significant and permanent value add for a subset of kids. Imagine kids come in Monday and Wednesday for lectures, uh, and then Tuesday, Thursday, they're working um, at, a, at, a, at an employer sort of job embedded. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're also participating in campus extracurricular activities, and then they're coming to, to the, you know, the, the CTE lab to do sort of hands-on uh, experiential work, maybe on Fridays or something like that. So um, uh, to the extent that the state policy framework uh, en uh, enables that kind of um, educational innovation um, uh, to continue, that could result in significant upside for kids. Um, uh, so, you know, we're, we're experimenting with a lot around the state, some of which is not good, um, some of which is great. And districts are learning about this. And so the stuff that's not good, we discard and adjust practices and the stuff that's great, we um, uh, try to spread. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioner Marath. Uh, you know, this is a very important conversation and you, you guys will be talking a lot with everybody in this community. As I said, these are some unprecedented times. Uh, we know how tough it's been and we know how tough it's been for you to navigate it. We, the, uh, speaking for the regional chamber, speaking for this community, we appreciate what you're trying to do for kids. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I wish I was there in person. <laughs> so do we. Next year. Next year, next year. So uh, now I am honored to introduce Cindy Giles, the Division Executive for North Texas and Oklahoma with Wells Fargo Commercial Banking. She's going to set up our uh, panel discussion for our regional education leaders. Thank you, Leona. And hello, everyone. Uh, Wells Fargo is proud to be the co-presenting sponsor alongside Toyota for today's event. Um, I personally am very engaged in the conversation and can't imagine you know, uh, many topics that are more relevant or top of mind for all of us um, today. Wells Fargo has a, a longstanding history of supporting local um, organizations that are helping children read at grade level, close the achievement gap, provide college and career readiness resources to the most um, vulnerable in our communities. Um, it's a really great organization to be a, a part of and to watch the success we have with those programs. Um, Commissioner Marath, I um, really valued uh, a hearing about uh, how you have worked to lift our public education system during this really challenging time. Can only imagine the hours of leadership um, committed to making that happen. Uh, we are, also very fortunate today to have with us uh, a number of regional education leaders that are gonna tell us a little bit about their experiences um, with the start of school and, and I'm sure many challenges. Please welcome Sarah Bonzer, the superintendent of Plano ISD, um, Justin Henry, president of the Dallas ISD Board of Trustees, Dr. Michael Hinojosa, superintendent of Dallas ISD, and Dr. Jeannie Stone, Superintendent of Richardson ISD. Because we know um, you're anxious to hear from them, I'm not gonna go through the extensive resumes of all of these individuals. Um, I'm just going to be here to assure you they are um, expansive and um, we have well-respected leaders to uh, help us understand the situation. Before I turn it back over to Leona, a little bit of housekeeping, please remember to submit any questions that you have for our leaders in the chat function below. Um, we hope that we get a lot of questions from the audience here. Um, thank you again for allowing Wells Fargo to sponsor this important conversation. And uh, Leanne, Leona, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so let's get started with our superintendents. Um, as we were talking before, these guys thought they were rid of me asking them questions, but nope, here we are again this morning, this afternoon. So uh, I hope this is a robust conversation and these guys are on the front line. So let's just hear from them. So let's start with our uh, uh, Ms. Bonzer. How has the start of uh, school been? All of the superintendents, it's been a tough road. Can you talk a little bit about just how uh, the start of school has been? for you in your particular district. And we'll start with Mrs. Bonzer. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about all the hard work that's going on 
I mean, across the state, but, but to talk about Plano ISD, we had about 47% of our families select the face-to-face -face learning environment and about 53% uh, wanting to participate in school at home, which is what we're calling it. Uh, and we did decide to start with a full remote for the first four weeks so that we could continue to train our staff and prepare our facilities with the appropriate PPE and protocols uh, to start face-to-face -face safely. And so we've been back to school face-to-face uh, -face for about one week, just a little over a week. Uh, and so we've had a, a, a relatively smooth start. There's certainly some bumps in the road to work out with procedures and helping kids and staff learn new routines, uh, you know, from how you walk through the halls to how you get on and off of a school bus uh, to all of those uh, very detailed efforts that we're making to keep kids safe. And then at the same time, make sure that the instructional continuity of what is happening in the face-to-face -face environment and the school at home environment stay in sync so that at the time when we fold everyone back together, uh, all of our kids are on track and continuing to progress in their learning uh, to be successful in their academics. So uh, it's been a, an interesting start. Uh, we think it's been a pretty smooth start. Uh, certainly, you know, we're, we're learning every day and monitoring and making adjustments. And we've all had to test our ability to remain flexible and in order to be responsive to the needs of the students, the staff, and our families. And that's very important because change is hard at any time, but this massive amount of change uh, in this time is especially challenging to everyone's social and emotional health. So we all have to be kind and flexible uh, through all of these phases of reopening, which is what it really is. Can, can really understand where you are. And Dr. Hinojosa, your uh, district has not started face-to-face -face yet. You, you will start it soon. What's the year been uh, like so far for you? You're, you're doing all remote to, to start as well, right? Yeah, uh, yes, that's true. And uh, this is my 26th year uh, as a superintendent and my 40th year as either a student or educator, 50th year as a student, an educator, a administrator, or superintendent. This has been like no other. I wish I could say it was as smooth as Plano, but it hasn't. Uh, we have, we're very proud of our principals and our teachers, and they've done a phenomenal job. We were originally uh, scheduled to start August the 17th, but right with Dallas County and the and the issues we had with the health, it, it got postponed uh, for three weeks. And we started virtually, um, you know, on, right after Labor Day. Most of it has been pretty good. Uh, we've had a couple of spots where there have been uh, a challenge. One was in the, even though we had the devices, the actual distribution would became a challenge. And so we're still working through that. We mitigated most of those issues and we had password concerns, but we've overcome almost all of those issues. The other issue was enrollment. And uh, when we started like no other year before, on day one, we were 28% uh, short of our projected enrollment. And part of that was a number of things that created that issue. But I'm glad to tell you here today, eight days later, we're down to 7%. So we found our kids, we're connecting them, we're getting them online, but that 8% is also differentiated. Um, and just like you'll see a different number from uh, actually 7% between suburban and urban counties and districts, uh, our situation, we're 90% economically disadvantaged. We, are, we, we have 95 to 99 to 98% of our magnet schools and choice students in school, but we don't have that for our Southern Dallas students and some of our students that are in accelerated campus excellence campuses, our ACE campuses. And then the biggest disappointment so far is that we're missing 11,000 students and 4,000 of them are pre-K. One of our strategic initiatives is full day pre-K for four-year-olds and half day for three-year-olds. And we had a door-to-door -door knocking strategy where we were going to go get all those kids and we've met our target. We've exceeded our target every year. This year, that number is our biggest delta. And I don't know that we're going to be able to overcome that part. Uh, so th those are the, the biggest hiccups we've had. Uh, I, I'm just got a report that early on, I was a little concerned because our 
our teachers were a little scared to come to work and who could blame them, you know, after everything that we've been seeing and hearing. But I'm hearing now that at the campuses that we've sampled, we have over 90% of our teachers that are there in person. And of course, we're gonna start bringing students groups back a, a little bit at a time. We're gonna bring our pre-Ks earlier. We're looking at bringing in our sixth graders and ninth graders so they can learn their new campus, learn their new routines before they're all expected to be here on October the 5th. Special needs students, we've started with them already because they're the furthest behind. And so um, mostly good, but you know, there have been some challenges and it is what you have to just deal with the challenges as you get them and, and try to get solutions. But later on, one of the other questions, uh, those are my, I think we'll overcome, we're not gonna have financial issues and we're not gonna have technology issues in the end. We're gonna work our way through that. There's another issue I'm worried about that I'll answer in a different question. All right, uh, Dr. Hinojosa, just a quick follow-up. How are you reaching those pre-K? You know, uh, you know, we've reported on a lot of those efforts. How are you uh, trying to make up for that first face-to-face -face knocking on doors situation? Yeah, we, it's very difficult to overcome and that is what I'm really concerned about. And you think about it, for a three-year-old or a four-year-old, uh, they have to be connected to a device. And so we we at, we, we went out and bought uh, Apple devices for all of our students at that age group. But it's just, how do you get people connected? So getting to the parents is one challenge. And then also, if, if you're gonna come in person, are you gonna trust a, a stranger with a three-year-old or a four-year-old? And and so we, we, we're calling on all our, we have a tremendous uh, supportive community, uh, uh, partnership um, with Early Matters, and we're gonna ask them to help out. But those are things that we have to really work with the families about how, you, and what I'm gonna predict, cause Odessa and Tyler started in, in August. And I think as things get safer and we don't have problems, I think some of those families will slowly but surely start coming back. I think Plano's probably experienced that. Now that they've got some, some of the people that wanted to stay home there saying, well, maybe it might be okay to come now. So I think it's just gonna take persistence over time because if we don't get those students, they're gonna be way behind. You know, they're gonna be all your work that students that go to our pre-K, at, well, at the time they take the third grade star test are way ahead of any students that don't take the uh, our pre-K. And so that is why that is a concern to us. It's more of a long, long, long-term concern for us at this time. And Dr. Stone, talk about uh, Richardson. Where are you guys in the process of opening and how has that been so far? So good afternoon. Glad to be here with all of you. Um, Richardson ISD, we started school virtually on August 19th and we had three weeks of all virtual school for our 39,000 plus students. And um, it's gone really, really well. Of course, that was the first day of school. Then we had, uh, we made a decision that was kind of unique. We made a decision that we would stagger our start dates for all of our different campuses. And so we started everything on August 19th. That was the first day of school. Then we had a second first day of school, which was on September 8th. We brought back all of our elementary campuses. And uh, it was just uh, the word that we used all throughout the day was this is just so calm. It really was calm. But um, I think it's because we had six months to plan and we, we capitalized on every single thing, every single moment that we could to be really ready. Um, so then we had our third first day of school this last Monday, which was we brought back all of our junior high campuses. And again, it just it went really, really calmly, smoothly, seamlessly. Everyone was so ready to get back. And then this coming Monday, the 21st, we'll have our fourth and final first day of school, which will be um, our in-person for our high school students. So we have about 53% of our uh, families have chosen to send their students um, face to face and, and we have about 47% that are doing virtual. And so, um, you know, this has just been, as Dr. Hinojosa said, and for all of us, this is my 31st year in education, but it's been, this has been unlike anything we've ever experienced. Um, but we are absolutely committed to, you know, to make this to be a great year and to see growth for every student. And uh, we're just finding new ways to do that each and every day. Mm -hmm. And for all of you, um, as we've talked about a lot, student learning loss and academic slide is still a big issue and a big concern uh, during this whole pandemic. Can you, each of you, talk a little bit about 
how your what your district's doing to keep students on track and move them forward. And how are you assessing your students? Are you using uh, some of the tools Dr. Morath talked about? Just talk through that a little bit for our audience. And um, let's start with Dr. Hinojosa this time. Yes, and that's the what I wanted to address. One of the things that we decided early on um, is we were terrified about where are we? You have the summer slide, but this is like a super slide uh, because of the we haven't seen our children since March, and so we've made a lot of progress in the school district. We've gone from 43 to seven improvement required schools, uh, and so and and so we had a lot of initiatives where we made out of success. So this is what we're doing, and the commissioner talked about it. A lot of people are against assessment, against accountability. But we've decided to take matters into our own hands. And we have our own assessment. We, this year, we went to uh, the MAP test, Measures Academic Progress. It's a national assessment program. And so we have decided that and that test is given at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year, and at the end of the year. Well, last year, we did beginning of the year and middle of the year. But just like the commissioner said, we didn't see our kids at the end of the year. So we don't have data how they did at the end of the year. So in these few weeks, when soon as the county let us start bringing some students back, we have already brought back 30,000 of our 150,000 students to start getting them tested about where are they on their academic progress. And so, uh, and then before the end of the month is over, we will have tested every single student in the district to find out where they are. Our teachers already have data on what the slide was, and we will start intervening almost immediately as soon as the teachers have access to them. We'll have trend data and aggregate data at the end of the month for everybody. But we also have a racial equity focus in this district. Some of our lowest performing students, we need to get to them right away. And we know those student groups are English learners, but in particular, also African-American students. So we're going to look at where are they, and then we're going to start our interventions process. So you have, when you're in a situation like this, you have to differentiate. You, equity is talk about is doing the most, giving more resources to the ones who need it the most. That's what the whole uh, ACE initiative is. That's why the best teachers have gone there. So we've, we're working really hard. I'm very proud of our departments who... And it's dangerous. I mean, you bring in five kids and at a time, we're testing them right now. But if we don't know where they are, how in the world are we going to move the needle for them in the long haul? So the, I'm, I'm very proud of that innovation. I'm very proud of our people. And I'm very proud of the focus. And now that we have the devices, we can do some other things to remediate and accelerate and meet and, and give them some support. So that's how we're dealing with that huge, important issue that you brought up. And Dr. Stone, what, uh, what's Richardson doing? How are you addressing what we, the data just proves time and time again, every year there's a slide during the summer, but this is like we've never seen. So Dr. Stone, if you can talk through what your district's doing to try to keep kids, get them back on track. Yep. So we like Dallas ISD and Plano ISD, I know, are we're all map districts. And so that is such a tool and it is something that we invest in locally. Uh, our school board made the determination that that was the type of investment that we need. Without data like that, we don't know where our students are when they come to us. And so that has been so important. The first several weeks of school uh, will end our this beginning of the year assessment in another two weeks, but we're assessing every single individual student to find out where they are. When you, know, when you have a number that the districts decides that, that we have, you really have to look at everything kid by kid. And that's a thing that a lot of times our teachers will say. It's finding out where our students are. We get them at the first of the year. And the expectation is that we will grow them, whatever it takes, by the end of the school year. But we can't do that without data. So, you know, we, we, value, we, we value so much assessment. Um, we value to have that data that teachers can use to uh, do things. And then, but it's what you do with that data. You, you can't just admire the data. You have to actually do something with it. And so our teachers are being really innovative this year. Our district has come up with a new program that we're, we're calling RISE, which is reaching individual student expectations. And so we're setting expectations for every single student. Um, you know, that kid by kid kind of, of vision is so important. 
And that goes for, you know, um, students who may come to us behind. It comes to us for students who need to be academically challenged. It, uh, it's, all, it's about um, our special education students who need, um, you know, us to assess where they are as well. And um, that kid by kid way of looking is what our teachers do best. But we definitely have to use data. And then, uh, you know, Zoom has also been a great tool for our teachers to customize tutoring. I was looking online last night and one of my math teachers at Liberty Junior High was saying he has, was having more, more kids show up for his uh, intervention session that was going on at seven o'clock last night. Everybody was bringing their dinner and coming around the table and he was so excited about how many kids that he had shown up show up, you know, meeting him at his house from their house. And so it's just that individual uh, approach of making sure we're intervening. But the summer slide, this COVID slide is real and it has to be addressed through data. And we're doing that at our, at our districts. Ms. Sponser, uh, to you, uh, are you using maps as well? I understand, but what other things are you doing to try to keep these kids on track, get them back on track and move them forward? Yeah, we. And like you said, Plano ISD has been a map district. I think we're there, we were their first customer in the state of Texas a long time ago. And so we've had the ability to build up data and, and be predictive with the results of map, of map testing. And so like Dr. Hinojosa and Dr. Stone, um, last year's assessments at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and now we're about to close our, our fall map testing window in about two weeks. So we've been, we've been doing map testing at home and for our face-to-face -face kids at school. And so uh, our parents have been our partners in this to help us uh, make sure that we understand where the kids are from our starting point. And then we have a tiered system of support in place so that our campuses with the most uh, needs are allocated the greatest resources, uh, both instructional resources and personnel. And so our campus improvement planning processes, those teams that are working at each campus then have, have received lists of who, are, who looks like they are our most academically vulnerable kids and in which areas do they appear to be the most academically vulnerable. And that's every student at every campus. And so the list has every child on it. So kind of like Dr. Stone said, we're not leaving any student, uh, un, like we're checking every child. And so um, map testing at K through eight uh, has been a, an integral tool. And then for our high schools and senior highs, we have a, a variety of data points because they do not map test. And so we've, we've looked at other data points and that information is being shared with their teachers. And then uh, through their planning efforts, they're providing uh, tutorials, individualized support, and then the tiered system of support, those efforts they're pushing into classrooms, even virtually to do small group instruction and, and tutoring. And, and so really getting down to the level of, of knowing the need of every individual child and then trying to use our resources to bring kids along and grow them as quickly as we can. Uh, it's a big challenge. It's gonna take a while, but uh, we're committed to the effort absolutely for every student. And, and we know none of this works without some funding from the state. So let's turn to some of your wish lists, your wish list for the upcoming session in January. So let's start with Dr. Stone. What, uh, what's on your list? Do you guys put together, I know, um, a list for the priorities that you're going to chat through your lawmakers on. Dr. Stone, can you talk a little bit what's on your list and uh, how you hope to, to advocate for it? Sure, there are lots of wishes on that list. Um, you know, pre-COVID, we had every expectation that the legislature would just continue funding last session's landmark finance legislation known as House Bill 3. It was just, the, it was a great legislative session where the focus was truly where we all wanted it to be, which was on education. Post-COVID, I feel like that we're back at square one, just making sure our voices are heard that school finance, again, has to be the top priority for this legislative session once again. And, um, you know, our top priority is that the 87th legislative session fully fund the promises of House Bill 3. Mm -hmm. uh, House Bill 3 made significant steps in providing the necessary funding for academic achievement in early childhood and math, algebra one competency, college and career and military readiness. 
and increasing the graduation rate. And so, you know, we have already dedicated resources in our budgets to programs like our expanded pre-K, which is so, so important. And so um, it's the only thing that these are the kinds of things that we will help us to close the achievement gap that we have to close in our district and in our state. And so we, um, you know, these are some of our most vulnerable students that we're talking about. And so uh, these, we, these funds cannot be cut or reduced. And so, you know, if you ask for our wishes, of course there are more, but we want the legislature to formally, um, another one would be that we need, we, we're all concerned about attendance and we're concerned about enrollment as, as uh, Dr. Hinojosa referenced. And so we need some hold harmless measures in place um, for those issues of student attendance. Right now we have them for the first 12 weeks, but we really, we really need them for the whole year if possible. Um, and um, then of course, always we need additional funding for mental health support, special education and school safety measures. Yep. Um, so, but fully funding House Bill 3 is going to be our number one wish priority request. Um, what we're going to beg for, what we're going to emphasize, and we're going to do that at all levels through our advocacy at the state and through. And so we really need our business partners to know how important that is. If, if we are to send you uh, work ready, a work ready force, we need support from you as well to advocate and make sure that House Bill 3 is on your legislative priorities as well. And, and Mrs. Bonzer, same, same list or you have other priorities? Uh, same you. list. Uh, I would say I'll, I'll just tie this back to the previous question about learning loss. The resources that it is going to take to close these gaps is not less. You know, mm -hmm. if we're going to live up to the, to the intent of House Bill 3 and recover the learning loss from COVID, there, there is not a need for less resources. So we need to be very, very vigilant and persistent in letting everyone know we will do our part to support our students and live up to the intent of House Bill 3, but we need everyone to advocate to do their part to support us with resources that enable us to be successful. Otherwise, we, we fear we will be set up for, for not being able to meet the needs of our students. And enrollment right now in the Hold Harmless is in the top of our mind because that is set to expire in about three weeks. And if we come back with less than 4%, you know, that's $15 million out of this year's budget. Wow. And we have 80% tied up in contracts. It is a huge deal. Wow, wow. And Dr. Hinojosa, uh, wish list. I know you're not shy uh, traveling down to Austin, but how are you going to get your list? What's on your list, and how are you going to get it uh, get it circulated this year? Well, there's uh, the board and I are working, and we'll have our final legislative agenda next week. But there's some obvious things that are at the top of that list that will make it. I don't disagree with either of these two. Uh, smart and charming superintendents. What they said, he ditto. But they also got a little bit of a twist on two other things that are different. One is operation connectivity. We got to have operation connectivity and we're going to do it in Dallas, but this is more than our responsibility. The state and the feds need to both step up and handle this thing because it also impacts telehealth, telemedicine. It also help, impacts job force. If you're going to apply for a job right now, you don't have access to the internet. How in the world are you going to get a job? So that has to be a solution. And I'm gonna be very vocal on that piece since I've been vocal since this thing whole started. The other thing is while we, we talk about House Bill 3, I also wanna add something else about House Bill 3. In addition to outcomes-based funding, in addition to the other things, but the most important thing to Dallas is that we have our top 30% of our teachers are making over $70,000. Much of that is funded by us, but there was also a teacher incentive allotment that is very pot that Washington DC tried to do it and they have let it go. Denver tried to do it and they let it go. We're the ones doing it. And now other districts, some even, I don't know, I think Richardson and others are trying to do this. But when they start tearing apart things because the state 70% of the state responsibility to funding is in education, higher education and health. And they have less money in sales tax and less money in oil revenue. So there's something's gonna get cut. So when they start dicing up House Bill 3, I'm gonna be screaming about the teacher incentive allotment because now the best teachers in Dallas, some of them are making six figures. 
because they can deliver. And we've doubled, we've got we've gone from eight ACE campuses that we started to, we have 40 ACE campuses because of that fund. And so it will be on the chopping block. It has to be that. I mean, they don't have, how are they going to meet their budget? So I'm, you're right. I'm going to be vocal. <laughs> I expect nothing else. So Justin Henry, school board uh, president in Dallas, let's bring you into this conversation. Um, Dallas is seeking a record $3.7 billion bond investment from voters in November. Make the case for why, okay. why this should pass and, and why voters should support it and why it's important. Yeah, let me start by just saying thank you for allowing me to participate in this and have two years teaching experience. Let's so sit back and listen to superintendents with over <laughs> a century of experiences. It's a, it's a welcome learning experience. So back to the bond. I mean, I first want to start with how the bond was conducted. So you know, we didn't just come up with this bond. The administration, they started having meetings back in September, about this time last year, matter of fact, probably a week ago, this time where we had hundreds of community, community volunteers and leaders. They began to review and research and discuss and debate and propose what we would need in DISD that we'd like to go before the voters. So I want to start with just the inclusive nature of the approach. If you went into 5151 Selma, you would see a huge auditorium full of people from all over town, all kinds of agendas, and we'll get to that in a second. So for more than a year, those volunteers, they met, they pour over the information, they debated, you know, what schools, what improvements, what not improvements, what schools would be included, which ones would it be included, do we repair, do we renovate, do we improve, et cetera. So I think the first reason that I'd advocate to put out there to the community is just how many folks were involved in this process. Not everyone gets what they want, obviously. Um, so you go in there and that's, fun, that's frankly the sign of a good negotiation if everyone didn't get what they wanted. So we come up, um, that's an incredibly important process. And then I just wanna talk about the, the bond itself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a 10 year investment. You're talking about 232 campuses roughly that are gonna get touched. We serve you know, 150,000 plus students of all kinds of backgrounds and all of those students will benefit from this bond. I have a huge binder next to me that tells you which each one of our schools are getting. And it's not bells and whistles, it's not cute stuff. It's stuff that our, our students need. People are talking about COVID and the spread of COVID within buildings. We're talking about improving HVAC systems and we're talking about facilities. So it, it's not um, something that people just came up with in a room. It's stuff that we really need in our district. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some just bullet points of what that looked like. So you're talking about $114 million invested in safety and security. You're talking about $1.1 billion for 14 schools to get replaced or, or renovated because some of them are somewhere between 56 and 100 years old. Um, you have $1.9 billion, and I'll say that again, $1.9 billion in additions, that's campus modernization, that's facility renovations, a school that was built 56 years ago or 100 years ago, not necessarily fitting the needs of 2020. And we talk about 2020, the next thing is, you know, $270 million in technology improvements. Um, you know, Dr. Hannah Holson and his team has done a great job with a long-term facility plan, but we need additional technology for our campuses. I'm gonna keep going. I have two more bullet points. <laughs> well, well, talk to me a little bit. It it's a big bond. Uh, it's a big dollar amount, um, and you know everyone's uh, watching their bank accounts and their tax bills come in. Make the case for uh, you know you your what's the investment there? You know what happens if this this bond doesn't pass? So I want to back up first and be very clear that. You know, I understand the type of situation we're in, both financial and um, across the nation. And we want to be clear that when we go before the voters, the administration was very, in that group of communities, were very, you know, very critical and very intentional about the idea that the amount of the bond would not require a tax rate increase. So I want to be very clear across the board that the amount that we're asking voters to support does not require um, a tax rate increase. And, you know, we believe just that our students can't wait. I mean, you look around at some of the facilities that we see across not only our area outside of Dallas, but across the nation, our kids deserve better than the facilities that they have right now. I have, and I'll be frank, I represent District 9. Um, we have some challenging facilities. You know, we have a, I'll give you an example, we have a basketball team that's one state basically back to back, and they're now getting their competition gym. Um, we have classrooms that need updated technology. You might see a whiteboard, you might see a chalkboard. I mean, there's just fundamental things we need in our schools to make sure we're delivering on the promise of our students. And, you know, um, that's what we're looking for in this bond. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's turn back to the superintendents. We have about uh, seven, eight minutes and um, pose a few questions that I know uh, folks are asking. For the superintendents, what's been the hardest decision you've had to make since the start of the pandemic? 
the hardest decision. And uh, we'll start with Dr. Hinojosa. That was easy. Go or don't go. And I've got ankle biters on one side. Everybody got to go back to school. I got ankle biters in the other leg. No, everybody's going to die if you go back to school. And, you know, it's just been the biggest decision that I've made in my career because both of them are right. And, you know, we don't know what we don't know. We've never been down this path. And you have to be empathetic about people's feelings. And this is something that no one's ever faced. And so to me, that's beyond a shadow of a doubt, the toughest decisions that I've made. And I make decisions for a living. I mean, I, you ask my wife, I don't care about dinner. Just got to make a decision all the time. But this one, we've had to be very careful and weigh all sides because everyone has a legitimate point of view. And that's why we've even revisited some of our decisions because we got more information. Now the more information, it just changed the context of what we had to decide. So that's that was an easy question for me. Okay, and, and um, let's go to Dr. Stone. Toughest question, you've, toughest decision you've had to make. Well, he took my answer for sure. There's no other answer you're going to get, I don't think, if you ask any superintendent, um, because it, it, it is. And, you know, it's. It, I, I talked earlier in the breakout session about how there's never really been a time where, you know, when you make a decision, it's you're you're lucky if you're going to get 50 50 uh, in terms of of how people feel about it. And um, but the 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 the. The big deal is that we're talking about a health crisis. We're talking about people and the fear of, um, of their lives. We're talking about um, risk that uh, none of us have ever made, ha really had to make a decision like this before. And um, so, yeah, definitely there's, there's no other answer to that question. Same for you, Mrs. Bonzer. It is, it's the same question, you know, weighing the responsibility of delivering on the promise of, of and education and weighing that responsibility with the, the necessity of keeping everyone, staff and students safe um, has been the hardest decision in my 31 years. Wow, wow. Well, we appreciate you guys and we know you're in the trenches and right on the front lines of this. I would not, uh, can't even imagine this decision and the angst that you guys have had. So I'm sorry to say our time is up. Uh, we could have easily gone on for another hour, hour and a half. I know people are um, have lots and lots of questions, but just wanna say thank you to this great panel of uh, courageous educators, you're, the work you're doing. I hope parents, uh, business leaders, you know, everyone in your communities understand the importance of what you do and support you. So um, this has just been a helpful and timely conversation, clearly. And we know how busy you are. So uh, really, really thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating and uh, being here and answering all these questions from us. Thank you. Keep up the good work, you guys. Good luck to you this year. Thank you. And now I'm pleased to welcome Drexel Owusu. He's the vice, Senior Vice President of Education and Workforce for um, the Dallas Regional Chamber for closing remarks. Thank you, Leona. Uh, and thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Inahosa, Dr. Stone, uh, Ms. Bonser, uh, President Henry, uh, for uh, being incredibly enlightening. I also wanna thank Commissioner Morath for his time uh, and insights. Uh, I, I hope everybody today found this conversation to be incredibly valuable and uh, informative. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our, our sponsors, uh, starting with our presenting sponsors, Toyota Motor, Motor North America uh, and Wells Fargo. Uh, I also want to thank our gold sponsor, Thomson Reuters, and our silver sponsors, Iconic IT and Encore. Uh, your financial support helps the DRC do its work every day uh, and really uh, work in close partnership with uh, our, our school districts and our community to uh, build the best talent pipeline we can. Uh, I wanna remind everybody uh, to please visit the dallaschamber.org website uh, for a recap of this event, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, as well as uh, continued uh, news and analysis and all sorts of resources around uh, the corporate environment, uh, as well as uh, the future of work. Uh, and uh, I want to remind everybody on behalf of President Henry, uh, whose passionate uh, articulation of the Dallas ISD school board bond 
um, uh, is uh, if, if you have questions or would like more information, please visit uh, Dallas Votes for the number four kids.com. Uh, for more detail and information, uh, you can sign up for a yard sign, uh, and we hope you'll support that uh, on the ballot come November 3rd. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for your time today. Uh, and uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>